Today's dishes are gonna be inspired by the American South, primarily from the state of Louisiana and Georgia. New Orleans and Savannah are my two favorites uh, here in the American South. But the food, the way it is, I find a lot of similarity with the Southern food, Southern Italian food that I grew up with. Let me get started. This is my version of a sausage gravy, which I will serve with a unique chicken milanese. So what we have in here is sausages that we have sauteed with some onion, a little bit of olive oil. Now in order to make the sausage uh, gravy is to add a little bit of flour. Why? Two things that we wanna do with the flour. We wanna cook the flour so that the flour itself picks up the flavor of everything that's in there. And as you see, as I add the flour, as I move it gently around, as it cooks, already creates a nice thickening. And you already see that the olive oil that we add in the bottom is starting to change color. Once this is completely dissipated, we no longer see any trace of the flour, the next thing that you want to do is to add a little bit of milk because the milk is going to be exactly the body that will give us this wonderful, wonderful finish on this gravy that we're putting together. Now, stay tuned because when I come back, I'm going to show you how to make my very own version of chicken milanese southern style. One of the things that we want to do with our gravy at this point is to add a little bit of chopped basil. In this case, I wanted to make it fancier. I add the basil cut that's known as chiffonade. I do it to bring out a little bit of flavor and also to give it some wonderful color. Now, when you make this at home, if something should happen, for example, that you feel that your gravy is too thick, one of the tricks that I like to do is to add a little bit of milk as the gravy is simmering until it gets the consistency that you want. When we're dealing with gravy, as in the case of southern gravies, a little bit thicker is not a problem. Let's take a look and see how to actually make the broccolini. What are broccolini? Broccolini are commonly known as uh, Chinese broccoli or Italian broccolini. Broccolini, Brooklyn and broccolini in Italian almost sounds the same. And I remember when I was talking to my relatives who had come back from the United States where they emigrated, they used to tell us, I live in a broccolina. And none of us would understand what that means because we assumed they lived in a field full of broccoli. Little did we know that there was a neighborhood in New York called Brooklyn, but with the Sicilian accent, the dialect and all, broccolina. Now, I wanna show you how to do it. First and foremost, I wanna add a little bit of red pepper flakes because it makes this Sicilian. So we have extra light olive oil in the pan, super hot. The broccolini have been cut in pieces and they've been parboiled. At this point, all that you want to do is to just add it in the roast state like that. Make sure one thing for safety, extremely important. When you parboil the broccolini, before you add them to the hot oil, make sure, make absolutely sure there is no remnant water left because the water, as soon as it hits the extra light olive oil, it will splash back and it would hurt you. Before we move them away, let's add a little bit of uh, salt, a little bit of pepper. Let's quickly talk about the technique that's going to ensue. I'm moving them off from the high heat, and I'm gonna take them on the stove here where the heat is down to a simmer. I used to do this in the restaurant, and it was another chef that taught me how to do this. And what happens over a long period of time, this broccolini, I'm going to reduce inside because most of the water is gonna come out, and they're gonna become nice and crispy, and the flavor is going to be explosive. If you like garlic, Right before you serve them, add some chopped garlic, some finely minced garlic, toss them a couple of times, and the flavor is gonna be right there. So we're gonna move this away. I'm gonna do a switcheroo. Here we have another pan with extra light olive oil, nice and hot, and the next thing I wanna show you is how to actually pound the chicken. The chicken is a chicken breast. We wanna call this chicken fried steak, that's how they call it down south. In truth, to us Italian, this is a Milanese. Very simple to do, wax paper in the bottom, wax paper on top, and if you had a bad day at work, this is a fantastic dish to make. Boom, boom, boom. You don't wanna make it so super thin that you make scallopini, you just want to flatten it up to a certain point. What the paper does for you is two things. It prevents the chicken breast from slipping out, and at the same time, it retains a certain amount of control as you deliver the blows and making sure that you do not rip the meat of the chicken. Now, before we get started with the next step, what I'm about to show you is extremely important because it's going to make your life very easy. Most people like to do this on plates. I don't, and I want to tell you why. I like for my chicken 
to go through the breading process in these containers. And the reason why I like to do it in these containers is because it retains everything perfectly well for you. I'll show you what I mean. Here is the breast that we have pounded. I'm going to add it right here. Before I turn it, I always like to put a little bit of salt on it and then a little bit of pepper using the tongue right in here. We flip it on the other side, a little bit of salt and a little bit of pepper. You see the way the technique that I use with the fingers going like this? It means absolutely nothing, but looks great on television. The next thing is something you're going to love. I have some extra breadcrumbs over here, and this is where most people make mistakes. When I was a little boy, I had a family whose boy was uh, one of my good friends, and uh, they used to invite me to their house for dinner all the time. And once they made the mistake to ask me, how did I make my Milanese, the signora that uh, hosted the dinner? And I made the mistake of telling them what I thought, and unfortunately I thought I was helping her, telling her all that she'd done wrong and how much better my mom was. It was the last time I had dinner at their house. So what we're gonna do now, we're gonna add the breadcrumbs on top. You see I have this extra bit, and by adding it on top, you're basically ensuring with your fork that the coverage of the piece of chicken is complete. That's where most people make a mistake. Then as I lift it, we go to the other side, and using your fork, you cover it perfectly. This is a simple technique. Some people like to run it through it twice, I'm of the opinion that if you do it right the first time, that's all that you need to do. Now, let's take a look and see if the oil is hot enough. I take a little pinch of the breading and I put it right on it. You see the way in which it's bubbling? This oil is doing exactly what we want us to do. Technique that's very important. When I lay the chicken down, the one thing that I do, I lay it so that the tip is away from me. Why? A lot of people splash this right in here and if you splash it, putting it from that side, when the chicken goes down, it could splash you back. Very hot oil very painful. At this point, it's cooked enough on one side, when I move it to the other side. And this is what I love the most, all the flavors in there. We use Italian style breadcrumbs, so the flavoring is fantastic. We're gonna let this cook for another few minutes until the chicken is cooked all the way through. Unlike meat, chicken, you never, ever want to have it medium rare. This is one of the things. I'm going to take one last step here with our gravy. I'm gonna crank up the heat a little bit. The gravy is nice and thick, and this is exactly the way in which it's supposed to be done. Before we serve this, there's one last step that I want you to do, and that is, once the chicken is ready, to let the chicken rest for just a couple of moments so that all the juices are perfectly distributed to the chicken on this piece of brown paper that will absorb some of the oil. So let me get that done, and I'll show you exactly what I mean. And now we are ready to assemble it all. Allow me for a moment to fall in love with this masterpiece that I did. Bellissimo, bellissimo, veramente. Io non lo so come faccio a cucinare così. For those of you that don't speak Italian, I was just paying myself a huge compliment, telling everybody how great this chicken is. The next thing is the broccolini. I want to show you what the broccolini look like. They are absolutely splendid. One of the things that you notice is that they have collapsed a great deal. And in the process of collapsing, one of the great things about this broccolini, you see it, is this crispy finish that they have in here. This is gold. Every time you bite into it, there's a nice crispiness to it. A little bit of salt that we added before is now sticking on the outside. If you're taking the option and you added some chopped garlic to this, it just takes it to the next level. So here we are. Now we're gonna add them to our plate. And be rich with this. And if you really wanna take it to the next level, one of the things that you can do is even sprinkle them with a little bit of Parmesan cheese. This is not really from the southern part of the United States. There's a lot of Italian in it, but I gotta tell you, nonetheless, it's beautiful. And the last thing that we're going to do is adding our fabulous gravy. What makes this gravy unique is the flavor of the sausages on top of it together with the basil. Always have some extra on the side because people will ask it to you for it. But this is quite simple, right to the point, full of flavor, a little mix of two techniques that I learned here in the United States and that I brought from home. And here it is, chicken milanese, southern style, with sausage gravy. Next, Nick shows us how to prepare biscuits and gravy. 
I know this is not a typical Italian sauce, but there is something about gravy that I just love. Look at this. Mmm, spectacular. The sausage gravy is a masterpiece. So, what else goes with sausage gravy? I'll tell you what it does, and that is biscuits. Let me show you how to make biscuits. It's a very simple recipe, but you really need to be focused on some very important details. Now, take a look at this butter. What I've done, I've cut the butter in small pieces. This is frozen solid. This is solidly frozen. Why? We want for this to incorporate into the mix that we have. In here, we have our flour. So here we go with the butter into the flour. Then we add baking powder. The type of baking powder that I like to use is aluminum-free baking powder. To me, it makes a huge difference. Maybe to you it doesn't, but to me it does. Then sugar, of course, a little bit of salt. What's followed next is something that you want to be careful with. What we're gonna to try to attempt in this food processor is to do it so that the butter mixes with the flour and creates almost like little pea-like texture. And you do it by, that's it. Take a look at it. it. Needs to incorporate a little bit more. The secret to making the perfect set of biscuits is to handle them the least amount possible. So we're pretty much done with what we want to do here. We move it into our bowl. The next thing that we're going to add is the buttermilk. When it comes to the buttermilk, Look at yourself, look at what you're wearing. It will not stay clean. Bl butter, uh, flour is gonna fly everywhere. The butter will try to hold everything back, but pretty soon you're going to look like a little comedian, but there's something gorgeous about the process in itself. Now, what I like to do at this point is using my hand to mix the butter, and you want to add it until it becomes almost like a solid matter. What makes the, the biscuits rice? What makes the biscuit rice primarily is the baking powder itself which has the leavening effect, but also extremely interesting is what the butter does. Imagine this butter as it melts and it cooks because it's very, very cold. It, it creates an effect very similar to what you've seen and you're accustomed to see in the making of puff pastry. Same concept of puff pastry, but with a few other things. So at this point, what I like to do is almost turn it into a bowl. Then we put it on the roll and we're gonna roll it out. We're pretty much to where we want to be at. So the next thing that we want to do, you want to flour the board. And then we get started with our action. This is a dough that does not allow you to be in a rush. If you're in a rush, this is not what you want to do. And you want to try to handle it the least amount possible. So what I do is I put in a nice little bowl so it doesn't stick. I use the flour so it prevents from sticking, but notice I'm not kneading it like I would do pizza dough. All that I want at this point is to let these layers to fly through freely, and that's how we're going to do it. A nice rolling pin to give us a little bit of the flour. Now you can see right now, you can see the butter pieces still in here, you see? I like to roll it about an inch thick. Do not go beyond an inch. I tried it before, it does not work to my favor. Now what I like to use is to use small little cutters like this to do it. So go completely like this. Uno, due, tre. What's left behind, I mix it one more time. Try to handle it as little as possible, using your hands to make the shape that you want, but do not knead it, like I said before, like a pizza dough. Here comes another piece. We'll put it right here. Here comes another piece. I'll place it right here. We have enough here, here maybe for one more or two. And you have to realize the more you knead it, the lesser quality will be. So there's always a little biscuit that's gonna be a little bit tough but the way that I make it and the way that you will make it at home is gonna make you legends. You can see already from the way in which it is that here is the last piece and we are done. So what we have right now is the oven preheated at 400 degrees. I'm going to add the biscuits in there and then I'm gonna reduce the temperature to 325 and we'll let them cook until they're ready. So here we go. The biscuits are ready. Ooh, look how beautiful they are, gorgeous. So, how are we going to serve them? Well, I told you before, I made this biscuits exclusively for the gravy. So, here we are, we 
put them like this. We could do all sorts of different things. You can move them around on the side. You can put the gravy on the side to decorate, but the way in which it's done is to just watch it go down like this. Let this gravy cover the biscuits with joyful enthusiasm. Let the gravy talk and say, I am good, because this gravy is fantastic. I made it, it's my recipe, Italian style. And so there you are. The biscuits here are for you, but for me, you should know that when it comes down to biscuits, I love them. The best way to have it is to spread a little bit of your favorite jelly right on it. I like to have strawberry jelly, and I say to myself, Stellino, you might not be from Louisiana, or Georgia for that matter, but boy, you're good. I pay myself a lot of compliments. Hey, Brian, how you doing? Oh, hey, Nick. <laughs> How you doing? Always a pleasure Good to, to see, see you. you. Yeah, yeah. Listen, as usual, I came from some advice. Looking for some cheeses for a dish I have in mind. What you got going there? Flagship. Let me try it. Flagship's our signature cheese. It's a cross between a cheddar and a gruyere. It's what we're most known for. It's fantastic. The amazing thing about cheese making is the beginning stages are the curd. You take curds, you press them and age them for a year and a half, in our case, 15 yeah. to 18 months, then you have flagship. When I try them on my own, I don't quite understand it, but yeah. to have them in a line like this is like tasting wine. Yeah, the raw milk cheese and the traditional cheese are actually aged the same amount of time. The interesting thing is the reserved version is only aged 11 months. So you get, you know, nice little idiosyncrasies that change in the cheeses, all the same cheese, same recipe, a little bit different. Brian, coming to see you here, it's like getting an education <laughs> and a fun one. Oh, I, I really don't know which one to go. Let me get one of each okay. and I'll figure out what to do. Sweet. All right. I'll take hey. Thank you, you so much. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate I'll get it. it for you. Awesome. Nick shows us how to prepare Nancy's lobster mac and cheese. This next recipe is my favorite recipe. Why? Because it's my wife's favorite recipe. I call this Nancy's lobster mac and cheese. Meet the principal player in this, La Ragosta Agostina. This we're going to use to make this wonderful, wonderful dish. But first and foremost, let's talk about the most important thing, which is not the lobster, but it is the pasta. What pasta? This is a traditional pasta used for making mac and cheese, elbow macaroni, I love them. First, we start by cooking the macaroni until they are al dente. So here we go. Ah, nice, let's stir them about just a little bit to make sure it's perfect. We're gonna let this cook, and then we're going to make the sauce. The sauce is also commonly known as bachamella or balsamella, like we say in Italy. We start with milk. We get this milk nice and hot. First, we put a bay leaf in it. Together with the bay leaf, I like to put chopped onions. Minced onions will work well, just as well. This is just to bring out the flavor. And then one technique that you have not seen in a long time, nutmeg. You need to grate the nutmeg. This little nut, trust me when I tell you, brings out a really sophisticated flavor to this whole dish that takes you to a place which I consider to be paradise. Mmm, the aroma is splendid. Do not exaggerate. This little nut carries a lot of character. So, the next thing that we're going to do, in this pan I have some butter which I've melted. I'm gonna crank up the heat a little bit and we're going to make a roux. What is a roux? The roux really is a mixture of flour and butter. As you cook this, two things you wanna make sure of. You want to move around, make sure there are no lumps left in by the flour. The flour has to toast just a little bit. The toasting of the flour brings out the complete flavor that ultimately we're going to have. As you can see in there, the milk is nice and hot. And we are now going to add this to this mixture that we've done with the flour so that it thickens up for us exactly the way we want to. So here we go with the milk and the mixture of everything. I'm going to add it in here. I have left behind the bay leaves because we don't need it in there. It's given already enough flavor. And then you want to bring this to a boil. And as it reaches a boil, one of the things that you will notice is that it will start to thicken. Now, as you can see, the bachamella has thickened quite a bit and the onions are giving it a great deal of flavor. But it's the amount of cheese, the cheddar that we add, and I'm gonna add two different types of cheddar. When you do this at home, I find the cheddar, not only is the traditional cheese, but it's also the one that really marries well. And I like to mix the two different cheeses because it brings out this wonderful combination of flavors. And when you are, don't be stuck just with cheddar alone. You can do anything that you want, whichever way you want. 
Now let's stir it about until all of this is nicely melted and completely incorporated into the bechamel. As you can see, most of the cheese has completely melted into it. This is giving us exactly the texture that we want. I always like to taste it. Mm, fabulous. At this point, what you want to do, you want to add the pasta. So here we have the pasta that we cooked early. And we're going to add it. Be very careful with this. Ah. Ah. But this is not all. We're going to add the secret ingredient. Here is the lobster that we taken out of the shell earlier. And at this point, what you want to do is mix everything just like this. Ah, fantastico. Now, do you see how creamy this is? I like to have an excess of amount of cheese sauce into this because when this bakes into the oven, the oven is going to be very, very hot. We're going to preheat it at 400 degrees. They're going to reduce the heat down to 325, 350. And we're going to cook it until it's nice, brown, and perfectly done. As a matter of fact, why don't we now turn this off and move it into our vessel. This is the vessel that I favor. Why? It's red. I love red. It's going to be enough for you guys, and I'm going to make some extra one for me as well. So here we go. Ah, bellissimo, bellissimo. Un sogno. Un sogno è questo. In Italian, this means it's a dream. At this point, right before you put it into the oven, you have a choice. You can do it just like this. Me, when my wife doesn't look, I always put a little bit of extra pepper in there. Why? I don't know. I like it spicy. If you really want to make it spicy, you can always put a little bit of chopped jalapeno in this. It'll be fantastic. This is going to go into the oven right now. This is absolutely beautiful. Perfectly cooked, nice and brown on the top. Nancy's lobster mac and cheese. And now it's time to serve it. And this is the part that I love the most. Look at this. Cheesy, creamy. Look at that. Look at that. When it comes to it, I always cheat. I look for the parts that have the lobster, and I go right for it. So the aroma, the smell, the mixes of the cheeses. I love this. This, this is for you. Me, I wanted to share with you another idea. This is how I like to do it for me. I put it in a little bowl, I walk around, and there's a lot more in here than it's in there. So next time you really want to do something special, remember, this is a fabulous dish easy to make, and if you don't have lobster, you could even make this with shrimp. It tastes wonderful. From my heart to your kitchen. I told you at the beginning of the show that I have a unique love for the American South, specifically the cities of Savannah, Georgia, and New Orleans. Savannah to me looks a lot like Palermo. Uh, for those of you who would be in Palermo, Sicily, you understand the similarities between the two cities. Uh, grace, beauty, but I think Savannah is even more beautiful in certain ways because of the fact that this great food and this gentle character of the people who live there. As Sicilians, oh, Madonna, we, we had difficult people. The thing that I understand is why people, every time they talk to me, they think that I come from New York. It must be the way I talk uh, and, and the cadence of my accent. But I want to share with you a moment where I really found a part of myself that I thought I had lost. When I came to America, what I wanted to do, first and foremost, I wanted to be an American all the way through. I only ate American food. I dressed like an American. I only hanged out with friends that spoke English. I refused to speak Italian except for Sunday, when I called my parents and have a long conversation with them on the phone. More often than not, it would be right around their dinner time and we would have dinner together. And it was in New Orleans that I was walking around with my wife. It was the first time ever that we visited the city of New Orleans. And I was totally fascinated by the food, by the people, by the place, and how it made me feel. Who knows, maybe in a previous life, I must have lived there. And uh, I remember walking around looking like a, a poster boy for one of those uh, American uh, magazine ads. There was nothing about me that said Sicilian, nothing about me that said Italian. And I remember from a distance, not that far away, a group of people walking our way. They were fishermen. They were coming back from their boat. They were talking to each other. And as they came close and close and closer to me, I realized that what they were speaking was Sicilian dialect. But not the Sicilian dialect that uh, they speak in Sicily right now, rather the dialect that my grandfather spoke. These words, as they came, they touched my heart. They touched my heart in a way that I cannot explain. It was for the first time that I accepted the fact that I am an American, but I am an Italian-American, and I'm proud of who I am and where I come from. 
And when it comes to pasta, even if it's baked macaroni like this with lobster in it, I'm happy to say that life is beautiful. And who knows, maybe I wouldn't cook this good if I wasn't born in Sicily. And thank God that I was. And thank God that I got to come in here and I got to express what I do. Life is beautiful. I love America, I love Sicily, and I am proud to be an Italian American. Signori e signori, buon appetito. Dal mio cuore alla vostra cucina, arrivederci a tutti. Grazie. My favorite breakfast is French toast. Here is how we make it. To some eggs, we add sugar, vanilla, some cream. Whisk well. The bread is cut about an inch thick. Add the egg mixture to it and let it soak real well. Just cook it two and a half minutes per side on medium heat. This is how we make French toast.